This is the second part of, of week three for financial engineering. I wanted to mention that um, on Canvas, I've posted an Excel file, and it's going to have some of the worksheets from today. And what I've done is this first worksheet, the first three worksheets, are the equivalence example of the, the um, uh, $5,000 loan repaid four different ways. So sheet one is the example where we have the um, $5,000 repaid with $1,000 payments, equivalent principal payments each period. And the total payment is a calculated number. The $1,000 is the fixed component here. This is hard coded in. Everything else is recalculated based upon uh, formulas. I wanted to emphasize one thing, that if we take our total payment, which is the interest plus the principal, and we plug it into this formula, P equals F over 1 plus I to the N, that's column F, we sum these up, this is the $5,000 that we borrowed. I want you to process that on your own. Okay, sheet uh, version two of this is where we don't make any principal payments. All we have are interest payments. And again, this totals up uh, the calculated number is the total payment, interest payment. This is a constant. This is a constant. So similar to the first one. Again, this formula on the far right. Version three of this is slightly different. So it's the same table you've seen, but the fixed component is this number here that I gave you, 1252.28. We're computing the interest that's owed. And the principal payment is simply the difference between column F and column D. This balance owed at the end of the fifth year should be zero. There's some, some rounding stuff because this isn't exactly 1252.28. So there's a couple of numbers off to the side here. But, um, and again, this is this is the number here. The, the one that I'm not showing is the the um, the fourth one, which where we're borrowing $5,000 for five years and um, no payments till the end of fifth year. And that's five years at 8%. So um, F equals P1 plus I1 plus I to the N. So P is 5,000. One plus 0 0.08. Eight is our interest rate. And it's five. That's the seventy-three hundred dollars. So the table in the um, in the presentation actually lays it out year by year, but you can actually do it in one step right here. Okay, so let's let's flip over to some new material for this this part of the week three. So where we left off last time was right here, and basically saying. Using equivalence, we can convert different types of cash flows to an equivalent value. And the key thing is at a common reference point. Typically, that reference point is going to be period zero. It might be the last period in an analysis. Um, textbook problems, FE exam problems might have some period in between. But typically, it's time period zero for analysis purposes. So 
let's look at what we can do here. If we want to receive $4,000 today, interest rate is 6%, what would that be equivalent to in five years? So we need to turn this, I think the first couple problems, you should turn it into a cash flow diagram. So 4,000 today, period is five periods, I equals 6% per period, what is F equal? And so we can pop it into this formula, F equals $5,352.90. Um, if you deposit $1,100 in an account earning 5%, after four years, what would the value in the account be? Um, I think you can rule out D, and all you need to do is pop it into this formula. P equals 1 plus 0.05, I'm sorry, to the fourth. And so it's going to be one of these two numbers here, just based upon the, right there. So some notation here. I've been using these, I've discussed them a little bit. I is the interest rate per period. N is the number of interest periods. So if we have one year, but I want to analyze this by a month, our number of periods is going to be 12 months. And we need to convert the interest rate, if it's an annual interest rate, to a monthly interest rate. P is the present sum of money. F is the future sum of money. Present worth, future worth. Um, so here is the equation for a present amount. Here's the factor. So you'll see it referred in textbooks many times. Um, the present worth factor and it's the future worth times and this signifies present worth given future worth then you'll have the interest rate and the number of years um, if you're using excel and i want you to use excel uh, i would i would like you to use excel continuously going forward this is the function. It's called the PV function. You need three terms. You need the interest rate, the number of periods, and the payment. I'm sorry, the um, future value. You need four terms. I, we're going to put zero in for the payment right now. Payment would be an interim payment. Um, let's, let's not think. I'll, I'll cover this at a later date. But we're going to put in F. Um, so that will be this F here. So we need the three terms. So we're going to put an interest rate in, number of periods. For the time being, our payment's going to be zero. And we're going to insert the F. We can ignore the type. The type, um, if you leave it blank, it's, it, it infers zero. If you put in one, it, zero means that cash flows are at the end of the period. One means cash flows are at the beginning of the period. For all practical purposes, sorry about that, there's an air show going on near me in Huntington Beach. Um, for all practical purposes, we are going to be doing end of period calculations. And you will typically, typically, always be doing end of period, calculation, end of period calculations in industry so we can leave type blank but if it has a square bracket it's not required so this is the present value factor the future value factor this converts a present amount to a future amount it's exactly the same rate number of periods we'll ignore the payment for now we in, in, insert the PV amount and we can ignore type Note that the sign is flipped. So if PV or FV is negative, 
the answer will be positive. If PV or FV is positive, the answer will be negative. That's just a nuance of Excel. And so I want you to be aware of it. It'll explain a little bit in this presentation. I'll explain it a little bit. So these are the various functions. And we haven't talked about a uniform series. I'm going to talk about that next week. But in spreadsheets in Excel, to calculate a present value, you use PV function. To calculate a future value, you use FV function. We'll skip the uniform series for now. To calculate interest rates, you can use the rate function. That's back, we can back calculate the interest rate if, uh, if you know other, um, other components. You can also back calculate the number of periods if you know the other components by using the end periods function. I don't use the rate function or end periods function that much in the industry. I use the payment function and typically the PV function. Don't use the future value function that much in the industry as well. Um, this is, I think the, the, the takeaway from this slide is that this formula, F equals P times 1 plus I to the N, the fundamental engineering, economics, financial engineering formula, is called the single payment compound amount factor. Okay. And I will show you this. Uh, you can see this in Excel. I would... Uh, I'll try to give an example later on in this, this lesson. And the inverse of that is called the single payment present worth factor. And so, as I said, you will always, pretty much always, leave type blank. Um, you notice that in the rate function, the rate function, there is a opportunity to enter a guess. That's like a starting point for the interest rate. Um, once upon a time, probably in the 90s, um, our computers, our laptops were not nearly as powerful as they are today. And so calculating the rate interest rate is not an exact formula. It's a heuristic algorithm. And so it goes through a number of trials and errors. So if you have it, it'll start at, I believe, 10% if you don't put in a number. But if you, uh, for all practical purposes, you don't need to put it in because our computers are powerful enough that it's not, it's not a, a meaningful time savings. You probably won't even notice it. But it basically gives you a starting point for the heuristic algorithm. Um, I want to say that if you're calculating the number of periods, your present amount, like I said, we're going to use zero for the payments for right now. These signs need to be different, otherwise Excel gets upset. So it's kind of an FYI. So what can we do here with receipts, disbursements? How much will we have in six years? It's going to be 500 times 1.06 to the third. Um, let me show you this. Well, uh, this is out of the textbook, cut out of the textbook, but 500 times 1.06 to the third. There's actually a set of tables in the back of many textbooks for um, the single payment compound amount factor for 6% in three years. This number is in a set of tables. Or you can use the PV, uh, the future value function. Um, Note that you don't ignore the payment. You have to put zero in for it. If you ignore it, if you if you only put three terms in it, it's going to assume that the third term is the payment amount. But we have to put D2 as zero in there. So B2 is the interest rate, 6%. C2 is the number of periods. D2 is um, 0. E2 is the present amount. And note that it flips the sign. So we put in minus 500. It comes back 
with 595.51. Now from the bank's point of view, everything is the same. It's just that the signs change. So if you're borrowing money, whoops, if you're depositing money, you as the individual are taking money out of your pocket. That's the minus 500 going down and you're getting 595 in three years from the bank's point of view they are receiving $500 today and getting the 595 in three years <clears throat> now the reason the signs flip is because this is the way Excel computes the um, um, the numbers and so if we assume payment is zero because this is uh, we're assuming that for now this this term goes away and you can see that future value and present value are on the same side of the equal sign so they have to have different signs for this uh, this formula to equal zero this is an Excel um, this is what happens in Excel. It's not necessarily classical financial engineering, but this is how Excel does it. That's why the sign gets flipped. So if you go backwards, if you know you're going to have $800 in four year, four periods, interest rate is 5% per period. What do we have at time period zero? Time period zero is going to be 800 over 1.05 to the fourth uh, didn't show that right here but if you use the PV function we have 800 we have B2 is 5% C2 is four periods payment is zero we have 800 as a positive number therefore the answer comes back as a negative number negative 658 that is 800 over 1.05 to the fourth now what happens when you have two cash outflows it's exactly the same you just sum them up so if your interest rate is 12 percent you do a calculation for the 400 in three periods and the 600 in five periods and sum them up and so that's really important because if you think about the problem from the last um, the last uh, video where we had thirty thousand dollars and ten thousand dollars annually of savings and two thousand dollars annually of O and M to analyze the project we have to be able to sum them up so so if we have one thousand hundred dollars in an account earning five percent after four years the value is going to be I believe it's 121.55 1.05 to the fourth And so you can use the future value function, or you can use the formula itself. Um, in industry, what I've found is there are some functions I use a lot, and some financial functions I don't use very much. I don't tend in industry to use the F, the future value function, that often. I typically embed the formula. It's so easy to do it in Excel. I typically embed it in what I'm doing. Now, if let's look at this and let's think about you personally. You're going to get a job when you graduate. You're going to want to buy a car, and you want to. You're not going to be able to pay the full purchase price for a car. So typically, when you buy a car especially if it's your first first major loan the lender will require you to put a uh, down payment so for example if the car costs thirty six thousand dollars out the door 
you can't borrow the full thirty-six thousand dollars. You have to put a certain amount down. Let's say that amount is six thousand dollars, and then you're going to borrow thirty thousand dollars. So if you want six thousand dollars, and your interest rate is a quarter of a percent per month, how much do you need to deposit today to have six thousand dollars in three years? Okay, so we're flipping between months and years. And implicit in this is that the the period the, the base period is months. So you don't work off of well it's a quarter of a percent per month, we've got twelve months per year, that's three percent per year, right? No. It's a quarter of a percent per month and we have thirty-six periods. Okay, so there's and it's because of the compounding. If you earn a quarter of a percent per month, you're going to earn more than 3% in a year. And we'll go through that in just a little bit. So we're going to use P equals F over, F is 6,000, over 1 plus 0 0.0025 to the 36th. So quarter of a percent in 36 months. So we got to put $5,400, $8,400 in today. And so if you have a thousand dollars and you put it in the bank for today this is the value of the thousand dollars after 20 years at different interest rates so at five percent this would be um, uh, $2,653. At 10%, it would be $6,727. At 15%, so, so it's uh, the, the $16,367. So you can see the compounding effect of interest and how it's not linear. And the higher the interest rate and the longer the term, the higher the interest rate, the faster this line goes up. The longer the term, the more these spread apart. Okay, so let's look at a problem here. We have, we're going to put $100 in a savings account. It, con it pays 6% compounded quarterly for one year. Okay, how much are you going to have at the end of that year? Okay, so we're going to get in now into compounding periods. And 6% compounded quarterly is different than 6% paid one times a year, once a year. So compounded quarterly means implicitly that you're going to get paid your interest every quarter. So at the end of the first quarter, you're going to earn $1.50 basically $100 times 1.5%, which is 6 divided by 4. At the end of the second period, you're going to earn a little bit more because you're going to earn interest on $101.50, not $100. And so at the end of four periods, you will have $106.14, not $106. So if it was compounded once a year, you'd have $106. If it's compounded four times a year, you use the quarterly interest rate, and you have um, four periods. So it's very important that you keep your interest rate and your periods consistent. So I see this a lot of times on... Um, the first sets of problems are on the, the initial exams that will get the quarterly rate proper, 
at one and a half percent, which is six divided by four, but we will use one for the number of periods because it's one year. They have to be consistent. If this is per quarter, this has to be the number of quarters. If it's per month, this has to be the number of months. So let's talk about now nominal and effective interest rates. And this can be a little bit confusing. Um, nominal interest rates per year is the annual rate per year without considering the effect of compounding. So uh, we, we, and, and typically what you see when you see an interest rate advertised for anything is the nominal rate per year. And what they're going to say is it's the interest rate per year. Or they're going to say it's the interest rate. They may not even say nominal or per year. And you just have to know through experience that when they say interest rate, it means per year and it's nominal. And and if it's if it's anything other than per year, they would tell you per that other. Now the interest rate per period is the nominal interest rate per year divided by the number of interest compounding periods. So what we did in this prior example was we said that, sorry, another jet's going by. Um, what we did in this example was we had a 6% nominal annual interest rate compounded quarterly. So we took the 6% and divided by 4. Now, if we have 12% compounded monthly, we take 12% divided by 12. And so it's 1% per month. Typically, typically, these types of monthly interest, monthly compounding happens on car loans and home loans. Annual compounding is a little more rare on, on corporate loans, quarterly, I'm sorry, not quarterly, semi-annually, twice a year compounding is typical. So how do we find what the true interest rate is? The true interest rate is the effective interest rate. It takes into account compounding. So let's say our, we're working on an annual basis. Our number of compounding periods per year is one. Our nominal inter annual interest rate is going to be the effective annual interest rate. Let me take you through an example of this in Excel. So we're going to work off of the 6% and we're going to go through the annual and effective interest rates. So just give me a second here to pull up an Excel spreadsheet. And so R equals 6% per year. And this is going to be annual and nominal. And let's look what happens here. So let's talk about the number of number of compounding periods per year. Okay, and that's going to be
So we're going to have one, two, so if that's annual. Quarterly is going to be 12, I mean 4. Monthly, and that's going to be 12. And daily. And daily, a lot of times, banks will talk about daily uh, compounding is, is a marketing now then, here's the effective interest rate. So we look at our formula. 1 plus R over M to the minus 1. I mean, to the M minus 1. So equals 1 plus R, we'll tag that guy, divided by M raised to the M minus 1. And so this is going to be, I'm going to put this in percent. And so semi-annual is 6.09 percent so twice a year you pick up a lot quarterly is 6.14 percent is, is that actually monthly 6.16 daily now, there's also something called, uh, there's the effective function. So we pop in the nominal rate. I'll tag that. And the number of periods per year that we're going to compound on. We'll make that a percent. So this is the function. This is the formula. Function, formula. Um, let me take a step back here. We, when you take the FE exam, a lot of the questions will try to trick you. And they'll talk about interest compounded, uh, the, the nominal interest rate uh, per six months compounded quarterly or something. I'm not going to try to trick you. Um, you will always see the interest rate shown as a annual nominal rate in industry and um, in advertising. And then the compounding is sort of implicit and it's based upon payments. And you just have to understand that. So I know if uh, somebody is talking about a, a home mortgage loan and they say the interest rate is 7%, I know that it's 7% nominal compounded monthly. I know that it's nominal because that's just the way it's stated. Um, when it's stated, it's always going to be nominal. And I know it's compounded monthly because monthly pay, uh, payments are monthly for home mortgages. They're monthly for cars. So that's just something you're going to have to get through experience. So this shows you 1.5% um, interest per month nominal and effective interest rates per year. The nominal rate is the, the annual rate without taking into account any compounding. 
so it's just 12 times 1.5. And then here is the effective rate with the formula. So the, the nominal rate is 18%. The effective rate with the formula, the effective rate with a spreadsheet function, the effective spreadsheet function. Okay, so this is a, a fun little exercise. Um, you might want to try it for yourself just to see that it works. I think you've heard about payday loans. Uh, payday loans are you, you, um, you need to borrow 100 bucks, and you're going to get paid in two weeks, so you're going to pay back 120 bucks. What that is, and if you did that, Every, all, every day for a year, what is the effective interest rate? Well, <clears throat> every two weeks, you're paying 20%. So your interest rate is 20% per two-week period. Now, it doesn't say this, but implicit in this is that you have two-week compounding because you're going to do it every two weeks. So your nominal annual interest rate is 20% times 26, 520%. Your effective interest rate is 11,348%. So if you didn't pay this back or if you lent a hundred dollars think about this as a you have a hundred dollars you're going to lend it and get back twenty hundred and twenty dollars in one in two weeks then you're going to lend the hundred and twenty dollars and you're going to get back 144 dollars 20 percent 20 percent times 120 i think it's 144 uh, anyway 1.2 times 1.2 144 dollars if you did that for an entire year, at the end of the year, you'd have $11,448. So why doesn't everybody do this? Well, because payday loans tend to have a very high credit risk. If you're willing to pay 20% to get $100, the odds are that some of them are going to go, they're not going to be paid, repaid. And the other thing is, is that if you, if you start thinking about the numbers, um, as they get big around periods 20, 21, 22, you're lending an awful lot of money. You're lending eight and nine thousand dollars. You're not going to do that to an individual. But if you do it to a group, the odds are you're going to have losses. And I think, not that I, not that I recommend this or condone it. In fact, I think there's, there's some real issues with it ethically, but that's what a uh, person that makes a payday loan would tell you is that they, you know, yeah, we make 500% per year, but we have 40% losses. So we're not making anywhere near that amount of money. Um, so that might be an interesting question that I'm going to, to pose for one of our responses is how ethical are payday loans and do they serve a function? But I'll, I'll do that formally, not just, not just right here. So if you have a, um, a credit card's APR is 12%, what is its, uh, with monthly compounding, what is its effective interest rate? APR basically means nominal interest rate. It says annual percentage rate. That is a nominal interest rate. So A is definitely not in there, 12%. I could guarantee you C is not in there. My instincts are it's going to be D. We could pop out and calculate the effective interest rate, but this is this is the calculation for the effective interest rate. It is D, 12.68%. So if you have a credit card with 12% um, interest rate on it and you're carrying a balance on it, you're effectively paying 12.68%. Okay. Um, I didn't talk about this, uh, but 
if you get into grad school, some of the esoteric stuff talks about continuous compounding. And um, my my grad teacher said it actually makes sense. I worked for an oil company. You have 24-hour operation. You have cash flows coming in continuously. Therefore, you should be analyzing projects using uh, an effective interest rate, assuming continuous compounding. If you buy that argument, and I don't necessarily buy it, but if you buy that argument, um, the formula for the effective interest rate with continuous compounding is e to the r minus 1. Let's remember this 6.18%, 6%. So if we want to do continuous compounding, we can look at the exp function. We're going to raise it to 6% minus 1. And so if you look at the impact of this, with four decimal places on the percent, which really means it's six decimal places, it's a very, very, very small difference as compared to daily compounding. So from a, from a theoretical perspective, continuous compounding exists. However, from a practical perspective, we only need to use daily compounding if, if in fact, we want to do that. So this concludes the lesson on interest and equivalence. I believe you're prepared to do the the homework problems and um, I'm, I'm available for questions on this. I recognize that this is new, new to you. The formulas are not that difficult, but the concepts I'm more than happy to explain.